The next time you're having breakfast, do yourself a favor. Take a peek in your cereal bowl. You may think you're just looking at kernels of grain, crushed flat and cooked, but you're actually looking at something much more significant. You're staring at the birth of the health food movement, the first scientific stab at a better way to start the day. Breakfast certainly presents some historically celebrated options. Queen Elizabeth I breakfasted on beef and beer. New Englanders washed bacon down with whiskey. But if you want to go with the latest trend, you'll have a bowl of cereal, either hot or cold. Breakfast cereals have only gained wide appeal in the last century and a bit. And in the last decade, they've even garnered scientific appeal. A study of about 19,000 people aged 12 and older published in 2001 showed that people who chose ready-to-eat breakfast cereals for their morning meal tended to have healthier diets than those who ate eggs, French toast, bagels, or other bread products. They also had a lower body mass index. The cereal eaters consumed less fat, less cholesterol, and got more fiber. A 1999 study even suggested that cereal eaters were less stressed, less depressed, and less emotionally distressed. Now don't get the wrong idea. Cereals are not the key to happiness. They may not be causing these changes at all. It just may be that people who are physically and mentally healthier just like cereal more. But in any case, there's no doubt that cereals do have something going for them. So what is cereal? What is the stuff in that bowl? It's pretty simple, actually. It's grain. When we're talking about cereal grains, we could be referring to wheat or oat, barley, corn is a cereal grain, rice is a cereal grain. What does that mean for us? First of all, it means hardly any fat, a little protein, and a good hit of starch. Most cereals also have vitamins added. They're either sprayed on during production or in the case of instant oatmeal, poured right into the pouch. It's a good place to get iron or folic acid, which promotes cardiovascular and reproductive health. In some cereals, like those made from oats, you're also getting two kinds of fiber, each of which performs a different function. One is insoluble fiber. Our bodies don't absorb this, which is good. It goes through the digestive system, absorbing fluids, and sweeping out other contents along with it. It's kind of like a broom sweeping out your intestine. It keeps things moving nicely along the gastrointestinal tract. The other fiber is the one that's been getting a lot of attention lately, soluble fiber. Oats are loaded with a good one, beta-glucan. Studies have shown that soluble fibers lower the amount of LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, in our system. In digestion, when, when you eat food, your body secretes uh, bile acids, which help to digest fat in your meal. Part of the bile acids is cholesterol. Cholesterol is required by your body, and part of the things that cholesterol is needed to do is to make these bile acids. How oats work to reduce cholesterol is that when you eat the oatmeal, it grabs onto the cholesterol that's in these bile acids that's in your digestive tract um, and actually removes it from the body. If the oats is not there, your body recycles the bile acids and the cholesterol. What happens with the oatmeal, once it grabs onto that bile acid, removes it from the body, your body has to make more bile acids for digestion. So your liver, which makes bile acids, calls out to the blood, I need more cholesterol, brings the cholesterol from the blood to the liver, makes more bile acids, and starts the process over again. So by eating oatmeal daily, 
you'll keep removing cholesterol from the system and your body will keep hauling it out of your blood. So how much oatmeal do you have to eat? To be able to lower cholesterol, you need to have about a cup and a half of cooked oatmeal every day. So that's also equivalent to three pouches of the instant. And if you eat a cup and a half of cooked oatmeal every day for 30 days, you have a very good chance of lowering your cholesterol significantly. Now that's a lot of oatmeal. But scientists are working hard to increase the beta-glucan content of oats. We don't have a lot of foods in our diet which contain a good dose of beta-glucan. Oats, of course, do. But they also have other nutritional attributes. This is the hull. It's the first thing to go when the grain is processed. What's left is called the growth. It's made up of an outer shell called the bran which surrounds the endosperm and the germ. The bran contains a lot of fiber and the endosperm a lot of starch. The endosperm is what is used to make white bread. The germ has a lot of vitamins and minerals. Some cereals will use just part of the grain, not oatmeal. It's the whole oat itself rolled flat. In fact, it's so simple that the process of making it really hasn't changed in the last century and a half. Although people have eaten oats for a thousand years, the popular thinking was that it was best left for animals. In the 1800s, the Scots and the Irish regularly ate oats and brought them along to America. The rest of Europe thought you only needed to eat oats when you were sick. In fact, about the only place you could find them was in a pharmacy. In the late 19th century, oats really started to make some headway in North America. This cereal plant in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, can take a lot of credit for the success. It has called this little spot on the river home since 1873. It grew very quickly. And by 1903 was the largest cereal mill in the world. It's still the world champion today. Six million breakfast servings a year come out of this place. While there have been many improvements to the process, for the most part they make cereal the same way they have for more than a century. Generation after generation has started the process the same way. Oats are shipped down from the Canadian prairies, emptied out of the trains and transferred into the elevator. From the moment the grain arrives, nothing is wasted. The oats are stored in these giant elevators, but that generates a lot of dust, an explosion hazard. So it has to be sucked away, and there are vacuum systems that do exactly that. The dust is eventually converted into animal feed. The hulls from the oats are also processed. They're made into a chemical called furfural, industrial solvent. It can be used to make resins. It can even be converted into nylon. But of course, the heart of the operation is the process that takes the oats and eventually converts them into the cereal that ends up on our breakfast table. The first stop is cleaning. The oats have not been uh pre-cleaned or anything prior to us receiving them at Quaker and uh, uh, we, we have to clean them of all the extraneous material and foreign material, other grains and that sort of thing to make sure we have good clean oats for the rest of the milling process. The oats, sticks, pebbles and whatever else comes out of the grain car are shaken down by four stories worth of machines. Grains are separated by size, weight, density, and even color from the less desirable material. Next stop, hulling. It's another four-story process. The oats smash against the rubber wheel inside the machine. The hull bounces off, 
and since it is lighter than the kernel or growth that remains, it's sucked away by a vacuum. Next, it's off to kilning, where steam is injected into the growth to destroy any enzymes present in the raw grain. Then the grain is heated to bring down the moisture content. Kilning keeps the grain from spoiling. The oats are then graded by machine. The heaviest oats, which are bigger and usually aren't broken, fall off the front. They go into old-fashioned oatmeal. Lighter oats, smaller and often fragmented, go to the B-grade or the C-grade bins, depending on their weight. A-grade oats, the big whole ones, are then pressed flat. They cook more quickly that way. The pressed oats are then packaged and shipped. It's that simple. This is a big reason oatmeal is so nutritious. It's just a whole grain, ready to cook and eat. B and C grade oats are cut into chips. The oats go through a series of drums inside the machines. As it goes from drum to drum, steel blades cut the growth into roughly three pieces. Next, the oats are steamed to cook them a little bit more, then they are pressed into flakes. Some of these flakes will go on to become instant oatmeal. Since they are smaller and they've been steamed, they cook very quickly. Some of the flakes will be ground into flour on their way to becoming cold cereal or ready-to-eat cereal as they are known in the business. After grinding, the flour is sifted. The fine material goes on to cereals like light. Bran is heavier and won't fall through. It's used to make bran cereals. The fine flour is then mixed with any other ingredients the cereal requires. In the case of many cereals like life, moisture is added to create pellets. The pellets are then pressed into a web. Thin strands of the exact same material are extruded on top of the web. This is called the fill. The web and fill then get a dusting of sugar to sweeten the product. Another web is put on top, making a tasty oat sandwich. This structure is what keeps the product crispy in milk. The outside web keeps the milk away from the inner fill. Next up, the cereal is stamped into its more familiar shape and it's off to the oven where it's cooked for 45 seconds. At this point, you have large sheets of life cereal ready to eat. A belt breaks them into small squares and it's time for packaging. And there you have it, a process that has been helped by technology, but is pretty much the same one used during the cereal revolution at the end of the 19th century. In 1895, C.W. Post, a struggling businessman in Battle Creek, Michigan, started a cereal company with $70 worth of equipment and supplies. Five years later, he had made a million dollars. This led to the cereal boom. Between 1901 and 1905, 43 cereal companies started up. People moved into town so fast that they had to live in tents on lawns. Most of those businesses failed in the early years of the cereal boom, but the big boys are still right here in Battle Creek.
Kellogg's and Post are right down the road, sharing a stretch of pavement and a big chunk of history. Although people did eat oatmeal in the 19th century, no one would ever have tasted cold cereals without Post and Kellogg's. Both played a big role, not only in the cereal boom, but in the entire health food revolution as well. Still, it wasn't a person named Post or Kellogg who got the ball rolling. It was Ellen G. White, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Adventists believe White received visions from God, especially regarding health. White preached biological living, rest, sunshine, and a moderate diet, one without meat or alcohol. Tobacco was out too. This may seem pretty obvious today, but these were radical ideas at the time. In 1886, she established a health reform institute in Battle Creek, which would later be known as the Sanitarium, or the SAN for short. One of her followers, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, eventually took over direction of the SAN and used the science of the day to build on her teachings. He promoted a program of exercise, enemas, and abstention from sex. He also promoted a proper diet, which included a novel idea, cold breakfast cereal, ready to eat. In the lab, Kellogg and his colleagues took kernels of corn and wheat and cooked them and flaked them. This was the birth of cornflakes. The cereal was a stark alternative to the rich breakfast of pancakes, eggs, and bacon that were common at the time. Even after their stay at the sand, people would have Kellogg mail the exclusive cereals to them. Kellogg's ideas gained worldwide attention for himself and for the sanitarium. The sand was known around the world as the place to be if you wanted to learn about biological living. It was here that the doctor, as everyone called him, taught people his ideas about how to get well and how to stay well. Amelia Earhart, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, President Taft all spent time here at the sand. It was a fantastic place to be. In fact, the guest list read like the who's who of the early 20th century. The doctor had an amazing record of cures here at the sand, and that's because he had an unusual admission criterion. If you were really sick, you didn't get in. That practice shouldn't undermine his accomplishments. He was a very skilled and successful surgeon, and many of his ideas on health were ahead of their time. Because of the sand, Battle Creek was known as Health City. C.W. Post, a patient at the sand and a struggling businessman, saw a fantastic opportunity. He learned as much as he could at the sand and then started his own cereal company based on the food that Dr. Kellogg had served. Five years later, he'd made a million dollars. People began kind of looking around and saying, well, if this guy who was a middle-aged bankrupt business failure can make a million dollars, I can too. I mean, it, obviously any idiot could make a million dollars in Battle Creek by selling cereal. People flocked to Battle Creek and started setting up cereal companies. The cereal boom was on. So they would come to Battle Creek and if you work for Dr. Kellogg or you work for CW Post in their factories, they would lure you away by giving you more money or whatever it was. And you'd forget that you signed a statement saying that you would not divulge the secrets. One person who did not cash in on the boom was John Harvey Kellogg. He wasn't in it for the money. His focus was still on health reform. However, his brother, W.K. Kellogg, was more entrepreneurial. W.K. also worked at the SAN. In 1908, W.K. started the Kellogg's company. Most of the other cereal companies had come and gone, but the Kellogg name gave his company a huge competitive edge. Finally, the Kellogg family was not just a force in the health food revolution, but in the business of making breakfast for the whole world. At the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair during the height of the cereal boom, the Quaker Oats Company was making a boom of its own. An employee loaded a Civil War cannon with rice or wheat, injected it with steam, then knocked the stopper off the front. 
puff cereal was blown across the pavilion where it was caught in crisp linen sheets. Breakfast was served. Take away the sheets, and puffed wheat is made the same way today in Cedar Rapids. Eight small cannons are fixed in a wheel. They're filled with wheat, loaded with steam, and then the stopper is released. Presto! Puffed wheat. You can find quite a few links to the past in Battle Creek as well. Some of the health devices that Dr. John Harvey Kellogg invented are in a local museum. Many of Dr. Kellogg's inventions address his fascination with the process of digestion. This device, for example, which may look like a trainer for cowboys, was actually designed to treat one of his favorite diagnoses, auto-intoxication. To you and me, constipation. You can also find a big dose of the modern world here. There's a combination museum and amusement park where you can learn about the history of cereal, rub elbows with big shots, and buy a few novelties. Now any collection of yahoos can get their faces on a box of cornflakes. Of course, there's one disturbing element to modern cereals, the amount of sugar in some products. Sugar coating a cereal isn't going to give us any more nutrition. It's just going to give us extra calories. So that's one thing. On the other side, if you have a child who won't eat anything except some sugar-coated cereal, I'd rather see them eat the cereal than nothing. Whether all that sugar is worthwhile, well, that's up to you. But it's tough to ignore the benefits of a bowl of hot oatmeal or some cold cereal in the morning. Of course, there's one other big benefit that really helped boost the popularity of this breakfast. It's a lot easier to prepare than the alternatives. Mm -hmm.